give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. We thank you for it. Hallelujah. Why don't you take a moment and greet one another and welcome them to Heritage of Faith and tell them good to see them. You watching by way of internet, we thank you for joining us today. And we believe that God is going to sow something specific and, and it's something amazing in your life through the word today. So thank you for joining us today. Hallelujah. So at this time, I want to welcome a good friend of ours that's in partnership with our ministry. He's, uh, him and his wife come to church here, uh, probably give them a first-time visitor uh, a card here, but um, if you come on Wednesdays, you hear him minister every once in a while. He was supposed to be ministering somewhere today uh, at, a, at a rodeo, and because, because of the rain, were you roping today, or were you, no, you were preaching, and but because of the rain, they, they weren't able to be there, and so I want, to, I want you to give a, give a round of applause and welcome to Trey Johnson as he received the offering. Love you, buddy. Love you. Love you, love you. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Boy, y'all are a good-looking bunch. You know that? Look at your neighbor and say, you're looking good today. <laughs> well, like Pastor Justin said, uh, Heather and I, we are always honored to be here. Miss Carolyn, we love you. We bless you. Would y'all give Miss Carolyn a hand clap? Yeah. Uh, those, those of you who we haven't got to meet yet, uh, Heather and I, we, we minister, we travel all over the world, we have uh, a lot of different things going, and as I was worshiping, I, I want you to know that Heather and I, we draw upon the anointings on you and Dr. Savell as we travel around the world, and uh, because we know the power of partnership, we draw upon Pastor Justin, Pastor Annette, um, and y'all, this body. Because we're, we go all over, and, uh, and we're seeing so many signs, wonders, miracles, salvations. Um, and from Dr. Savell, I've just, we've learned so much, you know, 20 plus, I guess I'm getting close to 30 years since I've been accepted, since I accepted the Lord. But Dr. Savell is one of the first people that I connected to. And ever since then, it's just like when he ministers, it just grabs my spirit, man. And he was all, always so gracious uh, to help Heather and I. Uh, we're on, you know, several different TV networks, and you can get a double dose. It's on RFD, Cowboy Channel, Sunday mornings, other networks. But when we were dealing with TV stuff, I'd, I'd call Dr. Savell and talk to him. And, uh, you know, right before he transitioned, I actually had a list on a text message that day. I was ministering in Washington. I was fixing to fly to Denver that night, and uh, I had this list. And I always wanted to respect his time. And so I, I didn't send the list because we've been talking about aircraft because I'm gone more than I'm home. And so we've been looking at aircraft and stuff for our own ministry. And, uh, and so he'd been kind of, you know, giving me wisdom. And then when I didn't send the text message, I wish I would have. And so now on my desk at home, I have eight binders, I think, of Dr. Savell's material on my desk. And... Uh, I've been asking if I had a chance to talk to Dr. Savell, what would he tell me? And so I'll go to those binders, and so that's where I've been. <laughs> uh, it's just we're, we're privileged, we're honored to be a part of this house and to be a part of the heritage of faith. And Pastor Justin and Annette, thank you all for carrying the legacy. Uh, Miss Carolyn, we want you to know I, I feel like a bird dog out there of like, Lord, you point me to the harvest, you know, I'll go. <laughs> but but it's because of what we've learned uh, from this house, from y'all, and we just honor them. Can we give them a hand clap one more time? Um, would you pull up Matthew chapter 6, verse 21? I'm not going to take long, um, but I want us to use this time as just a continuation of worship. You know, that our, our giving is so precious. You know, of thinking, when we give in faith, let's look beyond where we're at today. Jesus is speaking here, uh, verse 21, please, ma'am, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. And this is very powerful. And, and when we worship God with our giving, let's, let's see what Jesus said. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
So, so think about what we're doing here. And I know you know this. I mean, we've been taught this, but let's don't, let's don't take it lightly. Let's don't get complacent about worshiping God with our finances that when we're bringing, whether it's your tithe, whether it's a seed, whether it's offering, whether it's just worship, we are worshiping Him with who we are. We're saying, Father, this, this is all of me. The word treasure there, when you look at it in the Greek, it means the seed of emotions. It means all of who you are. And so when we're bringing our resources, I'm saying, God, I trust you, not with just my finances. I'm trusting you with my gifts. I'm trusting you with my calling. I'm trusting you with my talent. I'm trusting you with my family. This is me worshiping you. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, please, in the Amplified. So when we think about our giving, we're worshiping him acknowledging Him as Lord over every area of our life. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, he says, Don't be deceived and deluded and misled. God will not allow Himself to be sneered at, scorned, disdained, or mocked by mere pretensions or professions or by precepts being set aside. He inevitably deludes Himself who attempts to delude God. For whatever a man sows, that and that only is what he will reap. And, and, and we know this, but faith sees beyond the seed. You, you, you take one kernel of corn and you sow it and it produces two stalks. And on both of the stalks, there are two ears on both stalks. So there's four ears out of the one kernel. And each ear produces 700 kernels. And so now there's 2,800 kernels out of the one seed. So when we sow a seed, we look beyond where we're at currently. Faith always looks beyond what we're dealing with naturally. Faith looks beyond. When we tithe, we look beyond where we're at. When we sow, we look beyond where we're at. Say it, I look beyond. I look beyond. Faith always looks beyond and then takes what we see. Part of faith is seeing from our heart the harvest before we ever walk in it in the natural. So we look beyond our current circumstance. Verse 9, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Galatians 6, 9, and he says, And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint and acting nobly and doing right, for in due time and at the appointed season we might reap. All right, just making sure you're paying attention. We, we will reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. We will reap. We will reap. We, we will reap. Faith looks beyond the current and we take hold of the harvest, we do progress, we do advance, we are promoted, we are expecting, we reap. That's what we do. We are skilled reapers. We are anointed reapers. Faith looks beyond. Remember Genesis chapter 22? You don't have to pull this up and look. But faith, whenever we see beyond, that's what worshiping, when we're given, we're, we're taking it before we ever see the manifestation of it. So when we give, we're not plunking, we're not just soothing our heart, we're patting ourselves on the back, oh, we did the right thing. No, we're worshiping. Say it, we're worshiping. We're saying, God, you're worthy with what I have. You're worthy to, for, for me to worship you for who you are. Genesis 22, when God told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice Isaac, his, his seed, his son that he loved. And it says that Abraham said, here I am, Lord. Said, here I am, Lord. So he was willing, he was obedient. And he, as they went to the place that he told him to go, he looked at the guys with him and he says, me and my son, we're going to go worship on the mountain and we will come back. He was seeing himself already worshiping God with his seed, but he was seeing the harvest. See, when we worship God with our resources, we're already seeing the manifestation of what God promised us. He is faithful to do what he promised. He is faithful. Hold on to the faithfulness of God. Faith sees beyond. We're not just giving money. It's not about the money. It's about our heart. 
faith sees beyond. Faith gets the harvest and worships that I'm seeing the manifestation of the favor. I'm seeing the manifestation of my family restored. I'm seeing the manifestation of progress and advancement and promotion. Faith sees beyond the seed that you're sowing. Worship says, I receive, I'm taking it, the manifestation before I ever see it in the natural. He said, I'm going and we will come back. We will reap, say it, I will reap. John chapter 6, and I'm going to be done. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about worship. What are we talking about? Faith sees beyond where we're at in the natural. Whatever you're believing God for, what does progression look like? What does advancement look like? What does promotion look like? And are you truly expecting to see beyond the seed to the harvest? Because when we're giving and we're worshiping, we're, we're saying, I'm taking it. I'm taking it before I ever see it in the natural. John chapter 6. Jesus is speaking, 5,000 men, not including the women and children, 20,000 people. And what does he do? They, they, they say, all we have is five loaves and two fish. What does he do? He takes the seed and he lifts it up and he begins to give thanks. Seeing the provision for the 20,000 people he saw beyond the seed that he had to the provision that was necessary to take care of the people. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last. Before we ever showed up, he already went to the end of our life and he backed it up. The provision is already ours. But as we worship, we see beyond. Think about it. He lifted up. When you give today, we lift it up to you, Father. I want you to see it. I want you to see your gift and talent, your heart, your family your passion, your seed, your resources. Remember the kernels, this one, it's, it's producing. I lift it up to you, Father, and I see the provision in abundance, in abundance for everyone, every person of this house, every person of this ministry, this family. We walk in supernatural increase, and we thank you that we have the ability to work. We thank you that we have the grace to work. We thank you that our mind is sharp and our eyes see and our ears hear. We thank you, Father, that we have the opportunity to connect with you and to bring our seed, and we're seeing beyond the tithe, beyond the seed, and we're worshiping you in advance for harvest. We're worshiping you for the resurrection of increase. We're worshiping you for the multiplication of the seed. We worship you as our provider. And we want you to know we trust you, Father. Say it, I trust you, Father. I trust you as my source, regardless of what's going on in the world. You are our source, and we trust you. Say it, I trust you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Would you give God praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know the different ways to give, and there's envelopes in the seat back in front of you, and you can text to give. There's the number up there. If you're watching by way of internet, you can follow the give prompts on our website. Hallelujah. Faith looks beyond. Faith looks beyond. While they're receiving the offering, just, uh, just something I want to just make you aware of. Actually, Joseph, do you have the microphone real quick? I want you to give, up, give a testimony about yesterday. Give us an update on the food outreach. Amen. Amen. Well, it went really well yesterday. We had a lot of volunteers, 40 volunteers, and thank you for Team Heritage that showed up yesterday. A lot of bagging. 225 families were served. We did 50, about 53 prayers over people. Um, what was really neat is we had Laura Garza. She's in here somewhere. Where are you at back there, Laura? She's my, my interpreter, my Spanish interpreter, because we get a lot of Spanish-speaking uh, people that come through. And there was a lady that came through, and she received Jesus and then um, she had diabetes in her hand, in her arms, and she did not want it. And so we began to pray with her, and we got all the team gathered around. Everybody stopped giving food. We all came around, Vic. We all got a, all the guys that were with us, all that were loading into the vehicles. And we began to just tell her that Jesus loves her. And, be, and she began to say the name of Jesus. And I know what oh, aora means now, right? And so she kept saying aora now, now, now. Faith is now, right? And she kept saying to get that. So we're waiting to hear for her when well, she comes what about back. The testimony about the lady that came back from last Yeah, time? Becky got the opportunity to pray with uh, Becky Hutcherson with a lady whose husband had uh, issues with her gall his gallbladder. 
And um, she came through and gave a testimony that she had come through last month. And so prayer was given, faith was released, and now he doesn't have to have an operation on his gallbladder. Yeah. So these things are going on. I mean, this is what Team Heritage is doing here. Um, the love of the Lord is just shining. It's being fulfilled. Um, there's hurting people out there, and we are loving them for Jesus. Yeah. So there were 12 salvations. Um, Amen. I mean, it, it's, this goes Amen. on all the time. Yeah, and, um, and, and currently we have uh, Joseph every, we, we did Zoom for a long time every Sunday, mm -hmm. but now we're able to go back into Kimbo uh, Juvenile Detention Center. And so Joseph's been going every week, seeing salvations there every week. And we're uh, just did some trainings. We got six other people that are going to go in there yeah, as well. Brother Keith's going to be today. Yeah, so so. <laughs> uh, Keith Cotton's going to go today to the Juvenile Detention Center and minister there. Yeah. And then um, also coming up this summer, we'll be going back into one of our local elementary schools to yeah. be a, a mentor, um, to be, be able to mentor kids uh, working with uh, David L. Walker um, School over there off Risinger. And so that's the school that we've adopted and going to go in there and just love on kids. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and, and that's, that's, what, that's what Heritage, is all, Heritage of Faith is all about. And, and so um, if you would like to be involved in any of those outreaches, you can, you can see Joseph, go to our website, and how to be able to get connected with being an extension because the, the church is so much more than these four walls. Amen. It's about changing the culture of our community. That's why God placed us here, to, to be able to bring vision of hope, vision of healing, uh, you know, uh, that knowing that God, that, that they can come to a place where they can experience God be equipped with the word and go out and influence the world around them. And that's what we're about as a church. Uh, also, before I get into the, into the message today, tonight we have our next Connect class. So this is what we would call our membership class. And so I think we had about 16 people signed up. I think they also bring in seven kids as well. And so if you would like to get connected and you want to know more about Heritage of Faith, hey, come tonight, four o'clock. We have a dinner prepared. We pray over you. You hear our hearts, our vision, what we're called to do, um, how the church started and also, how we're going to continue to change our community with the presence of God and the Word of God. So I encourage you. Uh, you can go to the Church Center app. You can go to the lobby, and you can say, hey, I want, I want to know more about heritage uh, than, than be here at 4 o'clock this evening. Amen? Amen. Amen. You ready to get in the Word? Yes. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to two places. I want you to turn to Psalms chapter 56, and also want you to turn to Esther chapter 4. And my assignment, um, just as <laughs> Trey said, and this has happened to me a lot, is asking, Lord, what do I, what do I minister? What do, you, what do you want me to minister? And, and it's funny how a lot of times it will come in the form of, of uh, Dr. Savell's voice. And I'll, I'll hear, and I know he, he, I'm supposed to be teaching on faith, teaching on faith and, and honoring our legacy of faith. And, um, and so this is what we've been talking about. We've talk, been talking about faith. We've been talking about the difference of belief and, and trust. We talked about how when Jesus was with the disciples and they were going to the other side and a storm came against them, that storm that was coming against them wasn't to see if the disciples had faith or not. That storm that was trying to get them from the, keep them on the other side was trying to kill them so they wouldn't reach the other side because on the other side, there was someone that needed to be set free. And see, see that the attacks that are coming to your life, the things that you're experiencing and the, the storms that you're facing and the things that you're trying to walk through, un understand the enemy is trying to keep you from the other side because on the other side of your battle, the other side of your storm, I'm telling you, there's someone that you're gonna set free. There's someone that you're gonna change. There's someone that you're gonna be a light to that needs the presence of God in their lives and that's gonna come through you. And so that's what this life of faith is all about. A life of faith is all about fulfilling your assignment, fulfilling the purpose that God has for you. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Let's be honest, attacks will come. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. You either have been in a storm, you're in a storm, or eventually you will have a storm. And it is the word on the inside of you, it is the faith on the inside of you that is gonna cause you to persevere to get to the other side of that storm. 
Hebrews, I mean, Psalms chapter 56, verse 3. It says, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Now, we could probably put any other word besides afraid. When I'm insecure, I'll trust you. When I'm experiencing lack, I will trust you. When I have sickness in my body, I will trust in you. It doesn't matter what word we might replace with afraid. The bottom line it comes back to is I will trust in you. Right now, I'm in a storm and I will trust in you. I remember a number of years ago when I was, when I was facing something and was going through a difficult time. It was in 1997 and it was about three years, uh, two and a half years before I moved here. And uh, I remember uh, getting some bad news and, and hearing of a, a bad report and I, I was in a storm. You can call that, I think Terry says it this way, Terry Foy says it this way. It was a hailstorm, but you could spell that any way you want. Um, and it was just one of those storms that, are, that was really trying to, to, to keep me defeated. And, and see, a lot of times when you experience attacks, if you've heard me say this recently, is sometimes that's the last time you want to run to the Word of God. And see, that's where we find ourselves. And when we're going through difficult times is a lot of times we run from God instead of running to God. But we have to be able to run to the one that has the answer. And so that's what I had to come to the place with because honestly, I just wanted to quit. Honestly, I just wanted to go back and do some other things that I was doing because, because I didn't like the pressure. I didn't like the pressure. Now, I wasn't planning on saying this, but, but understand, we, we, will all exper always experience, we will always experience pressure from time to time. Let me say something I learned is you will make decisions under pressure, but don't make decisions because of pressure. And sometimes if we're making decisions because of pressure, it may not be the right decision. The word tells us that, that we need to wait upon the Lord. This is for someone in here. This was not the direction I was going. So, so it says we need to wait upon the Lord because it's when we wait upon the Lord, he is going to renew our strength. So when I was going through this particular thing, I wanted to quit. And I, I remember the Lord saying, uh, Holy Spirit saying down in my heart, quit and do what? Yeah. Quit and do what? I was like, and he said, go read the book of John. John he goes, go read John chapter four. And I'm like, man, there's like 70 verses. And I'm reading and I'm like, hey, you're the bread of life. I get this. They multiplied. They, they did all this and, and all that. And I finally get to like the last seven verses. And, and Jesus is talking to the disciples. And, and Jesus had 82 people following him at the time. And, and uh, as disciples, not necessarily all the masses of people, but the 70 say, this is, this is a hard thing for us to hear. And, then, and so they walked away and Jesus looked at the disciples and says, Peter, are you too going to walk away? And he's like, where am I going to go? You've got the words of life. And so when I got to that, the Lord said, was reminding me of what I said, quit and do what? And, and so, so <laughs> Holy Spirit was like, Justin, where are you going to go? You've seen too much. You, you've seen my hand move too much. You've You've seen me do things in your life. What, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? You got to keep going forward. You got to keep going forward. You got to keep going forward. So when you're going through difficult times, that's the time trust is about leaning into God. See, we can, all, we can talk about, I believe in God and I believe in God's existence. But it's a whole other thing when you lean all that you are into him. having to lean into him. So when I'm afraid, the psalmist says here, I will trust in God. In difficult times, we need to always remember, I will trust in God. Being under pressure, I will trust in God. Not knowing which way to turn next, I will trust in God. Let's look at here in, in Esther chapter four. And most of the time when we look at this chapter, we, a lot of times we focus on the part of the scripture that says, for Esther was born for such a time as this. We like that scripture, don't we? Yes. 
but that's not what I want to focus on this morning. But I just, I just felt in my heart I, I needed to deposit this thought because, because you understand the Israelites, the Jewish people were going upon a national assault against them. This is a big thing. This, the Jewish people are in bondage to this whole group of people, Artaxerxes and, and all that. And yet, so Esther gets sent to, she, she, they do this whole process. I'm not going to go into the detail, but she gets part of the Artaxerxes, his, his uh, whole harem, I guess you could say. And yet here she is in a position of authority and has the ability to do something about it. And, and this has been a period of time because it, we know at least it was at least one year she was here in the palace. And when you're in the palace, you're living good in the neighborhood. I mean, I mean, think about here. She's eating good food. She's accepted. The best linens, the best of everything. And here she is on an assignment. And maybe not know exactly what that assignment may look like, but I'm just thinking that here Mordecai, her uncle, is like, don't get complacent in your assignment. And he says something to her. He sends some, some actually some people to talk to her. Now, I want you to hear this, verse 13. I want you to hear Mordecai's faith. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Hmm. Now get this, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I want you to hear Mordecai's faith. Mordecai was not putting his faith in Esther. See, we can't put our faith in people. You can't put your faith in a government. You can't put your faith in structures. <laughs> if you just look at you can't put your faith in a justice system. You can't put your faith in, in anyone. The natural. Paul says this. He goes, my faith... He goes, let your faith not be in the wisdom of men, but let your faith be in the power of God. First Corinthians chapter two, verse five. So let your wisdom stand, not in the wisdom of men, but let your faith stand in the power of God. Too often we're leaning into people instead of leaning into God. And so Mordecai wasn't leaning into Esther to be the sole source of, her, of his answer. Now, he was reminding her of what she has the ability to do, but ultimately he was saying, whether you do this or not, it doesn't matter. If you don't do what you're called to do, God will call someone else to arise up and send deliverance and send relief from someone else. I want you to know you might be going through something right now, but I, need you to, I want you to know that God's gonna send relief and it might not be who you think it might come from. We're not to put our trust in man. We're put our trust in God. Yes, sir. That's good. I will trust in I will trust in God, and I will not trust in man. I, I didn't read that part in, in in Psalms 56. But we have to put and totally lean upon God because the world system will fail. The world system is failing. We have to trust in God. Paul said this in first, uh, second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. He says, we walk by faith and not by sight. What I've learned from Dr. Savell is, is, is that the basic definition of faith is faith is believing God's word no matter what my five physical senses tell me. If I went by my five physical senses, I wouldn't be standing here today. If, we, if I went by my emotions, I wouldn't be here today. That's not to mean that we don't have emotions. That doesn't mean that we don't experience things and all that. But what I understand is, is we have to place and totally lean all that we are into him. Go to Psalms 91. Faith continues to stand 
when it gets uncomfortable or it looks impossible. Let me say it again. Faith continues to stand when things get uncomfortable or look impossible. Let's look at Psalm 91. This is Moses. This is the writing of the Moses, Psalms 91. Now listen to what he says here. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High dwells. He who dwells. To dwell, someone is, is to dwell somewhere is to live somewhere. Yes. He who lives in the secret place. He who lives in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. So here we have two words. We have live and we have abide. And there are two words that mean really in our, in our, in our English understanding, they're pretty, you know, pretty much the same thing. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. See, abiding is a little bit different. Abiding is more about remaining in a place versus visiting a place. Too often we might like to visit God, but do we like to abide in God? See, there's a difference from visitation to habitation. I'm, I'm grateful for the visitations of God, but I want to come to a place where I, ha I have habitations with God. And so here, here he is, he who remains, he who, he who dwells, he who lives in the secret place of the Most High shall sit down and remain. That's what about sit down and remain under the shadow of of the Almighty, the Almighty, <laughs> the shadow of the Almighty, Almighty, the one in whom nothing is impossible. So, so here what Moses is saying, and, and Moses is really leaning into God in difficult times. He's leaning in for rescue. That's what this, this chapter is all about, is about protection and rescue. So Moses is saying, he who lives in the secret place of the Most High shall sit down and remain in the shadow of him whom nothing is impossible. So when I, when I retreat to the secret place, that's what trust has to do, has to always lean into God no matter what's happening. And when I'm going through a difficult time, that, that comes a time where I've got to sit down and I need to remain in the shadow of him whom nothing is impossible. Because I'm telling you, the enemy, the enemy has noise. The enemy has a voice. Other people have voices. Other people have noise. Your, your emotions have noise. And there's all sorts of things that are going to come at you. But it's when you choose to lean into him and you come to a place where I'm going to sit down and remain in the shadow of him whom nothing is impossible. Verse two says, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge. So when he gets there in that place, he says something. I'm sitting and remaining in the shadow of him whom nothing is impossible. And he gets there and he says, I will. I will say he is my refuge and he is my strength. Then what does verse four say? Surely. Surely, surely, actually verse two says, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. In him I will lean. And when he does that, he tells us what takes place. Surely, surely he shall deliver me. Remember last week we talked about he's not only a God that can do something, but he's a God that will do something. He Surely, surely, that's like positively. It, it, it's, like, it's like indeed. Really, that's how it translates, indeed, indeed. What will God do? He will come through indeed. It will take place indeed. It, it's gonna happen, surely, surely. It, it, it's, it's gonna happen. Tell me it's gonna happen. So when I come to this place and I'm leaning into him and I'm trusting into him and I put all that I am on him in him, he surely will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. 
and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you can take refuge. See, this is, this is about trusting in him. This is about leaning into him and all that you are into him. So Mordecai was at a place where he was like, I'm not trust, I, I can't trust in Esther. Although I know she's the one that's called to do something. But Esther had faith as well. They set up a whole fast. She says, okay, send back this message. Tell all of our people to fast. She told all of her servants in the, in, in the palace to, to fast. And she was like, because she got to a place where God's gonna come through. I'm here and was born for such a time as this. And we could go through all of Psalms 91, but what I want you to see is in difficult times, in times of storms, we have to lean in to him. That's what trust is all about. I'm gonna lean upon you. I'm gonna lean in to you. Go to Acts 27. Let's look at Paul. I mean, Paul knew firsthand about adversity. <laughs> Paul knew adversity. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Really? Huh. Let's look at verse 10. I wasn't planning on saying this, but... Saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss not only of the cargo in the ship, but also for our lives. Nevertheless, 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 the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman, that was the pilot, the captain, and the owner of the ship. That's interesting. Here, Paul foresaw something. Because Paul, Paul's got a calling upon his life. And Paul is foreseeing something and saying, wait a minute, there's going to be a disaster here. And yet he's telling his guard, he's telling the one that's in charge of him in prison on the ship and says, hey, I, I'm telling this. He goes, but, you know, I'd rather believe the pilot. I'd rather believe the pilot and I'd rather believe the owner of the ship than you, man of God. Hmm. Now, hold on to that, that thought. And th there was a storm that came up, as, as Paul had said. Let's look at verse 20. For the sake of time, let's look at verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Whoa. Okay. I wasn't, whoo. The Bible says, this might not have to do with faith and difficulty, but it does have to do with faith, but I think this is for some people in here. Proverbs tells us, in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Paul was wise counsel. And yet, the centurion listened to someone else. And Paul even goes on and says, men, you should have listened to me and not had sailed from Crete and incurred this disastrous disaster and loss. And then he says, and now I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you. Only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Who do you belong to? Who are you serving? Paul had an assignment on his life and they're experiencing a storm and he was trying to even help the people out to not experience the storm. You know, there's some storms that you may have faced that you didn't have to face, but you didn't listen to wise counsel. 
You know what? There's some storms that I went through that I would have never had to gone through if I had listened to wise counsel. But thank God for his grace and thank God for his mercy. Paul said there will be no loss of life. But listen to, his, listen to his statement here. He says, for there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. So when Paul was going through these difficult times, this, this is what it reveals to me, Pastor Phil, that when Paul was in the storm, even though God had gave them direction about the storm, he told him about the storm. He even told who, who mattered about the storm. But yet what happened? He leaned in to God. Okay, God, I did what you told me to do. What you, he's still pressing in. He's still pressing in to God. He's still pressing into God. The storm comes and that may, what is he saying? He goes, okay, the first thing he told me, this was gonna be disastrous and this, there was gonna be loss, but, but okay, God, what's gonna happen here? Because I was obedient and I know I have an assignment on my life. I've got a call upon my life. I'm called to do something. I'm called to change something. I'm called to speak this gospel, this revelation of Jesus Christ. And I can't die out here in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. So what did he do? He leaned into God. And he said, for there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve. If you read the Amplified, that word serve means worship. There's one I worship. So what did Paul do in the midst of knowing a disaster was come? He leaned into worship. He leaned into worship. He leaned into praise. He leaned into to seeking the Lord. He leaned in to trusting in him in these difficult times. And that's what we have to continue to do. Even when we don't feel like it, we've got to lean into him. We've got to lean into him. This is one I belong. Does he have ownership over you? Lord, I'm yours. All I am is yours. All I have is yours. Verse 24 saying, now get this, do not be afraid, Paul. So what did the angel of the Lord speak to him that was standing by him? Don't be afraid, Paul. But was he speak to him? You must, you must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Hallelujah. See, there comes a time also in life when you're going through things where you need to help people through that storm. Hey, get on. Hey, get on. Get on, get on, get on my faith. Get on my faith. Come on, let's go. Let's get through this. Let's get through this. Let's get, let's, let's get through this. But you know what? If you don't come to a place where you are leaning into God, then you're not going to be a, a source for someone else to get them through their storm. Because your faith isn't about you. Oh, isn't all about you. Your faith is about the kingdom of God. God has granted you all those who sail with you. Verse 25, and get this. Therefore, take heart. So now what is he speaking? Therefore, take courage. Here they are in the midst of the storm. Therefore, take courage, be brave, have faith. For I believe God. Take heart, men, for I believe God, I trust in God, that it will be just as it was told me. I believe that it will be just as it was told you, told me. I'm telling you, as you hold on to him, as you lean into him, Paul's saying, hey, just trust in him. As I trusted him, he told me it was gonna be just like he told me to do. What he said he would do, he would do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. There's no way I'm going to finish this today. So just go to Romans chapter four and we'll, I'm going to do this and I believe I'm supposed to transition and we'll pick up next week. Hallelujah. So in difficult times, we need to trust in God, not man. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. In difficult times, we need to trust. Our trust is seen when we lean into him or when we pursue him. 
Paul knew something about leaning into him and holding on to the promise. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 4. Let's look at verse 18. Now, he uses the story of, the, this is all about the promises through faith. How many people hear that you're holding on to some promises? His promises. Word says his promises are yes and amen. That are always in him are yes and amen. His promises. There's some promises I'm holding on to. Paul was holding on to promises. And he had the word of God to be able to stand upon. He tells us in actually Romans 15, he tells us that the things that were written for our time, for uh, a four time written before were written for our learning that we could have, we, that we might have hope and comfort in the scriptures. So Paul, not only was he ministering things here to the church of Rome, but he was really letting us into his faith walk. See, if we just look at these things as stories, then we don't understand that when I see Paul writing, I'm not just hearing some sort of religious thing, but he's letting me into his faith walk. He's letting me into to how did he, what was he thinking, Vic, when he was being stoned outside of Lystra? What was he thinking when that storm was going on in Acts chapter 27? What? You know what? He wasn't just shipwrecked one time. He was shipwrecked three times. He just didn't get, get beat one time. But he got beat many times. He got stoned more than one time and left for dead. But got up and went back into the place that stoned him and stood up and preached the gospel. <laughs> Storms? Paul had storms. Paul had hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons. But when we hear him ministering things, you have to see that this is something that he's holding on in how he's going to make it through to fulfill his assignment. I must stand before Caesar. I must, see, that's the, see, we, we have to get the vision. What is your must? Yeah. Yes, that's good. What is your must? What, what must, what must you do? Because yeah. what must you do is what fuels your life and ministry. Yeah. Yeah. See, you know what you're called to do, but until you understand your why, you won't have the force to fulfill it. Yeah. When I understand my why, yeah. why I exist, then when storms come, the storms aren't gonna defeat me because I've got a why. I've got a reason. I've, I've got, is there not a cause? I've got something that I'm called to do and this storm's not gonna defeat me. It doesn't matter what this person says. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what someone says. I will fulfill my assignment. So here, let's, let's look at this because, because he correlates the, the story of Abraham and he's correlating it to a life of righteousness and, and, and about this being accredited to Abraham as righteousness. And so how he communicates this for the sake of time, let's look at, um, let's go ahead and look at verse uh, 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith. Now he's letting us in some insight into Abraham's faith. But this was Paul's revelation. And don't be weak in faith. And it said he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of 
Sarah's womb. So let's pull, let's, let's pull, un- unpack this just for a moment. You got five minutes? He didn't consider the thief to your promise is what you're considering. The thief to your promise is you trying to reason things out. The thief to your promise is counseling with, is getting wisdom from wrong people. The thief to your, the things that you're considering. See, they didn't consider. They, Abraham had to come to a place because there was a time they did consider it. And they got Ishmael. But it had to get to the point where they wouldn't consider the natural situation, the natural circumstance. Consider not the fact that he was already 100 years old and dead. And Sarah had a dead womb. Consider not. Another way is didn't take a second thought. When we consider things, consider that, oh, we could do that or we could do that. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that is destruction. I don't, I don't want to go after things that seem right any longer. I, I've done that and, and, and just, no, I, I, need, I need to find out what is right, is right. Paul was giving them on that sea what, okay, this is the way that is right. This is the way we're going to do it. But they said, uh, I'm going to trust, I'm going to trust the one knows a little bit more about this than you, Paul. You're just, you're a preacher and you're a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I think I'm going to tr- trust the owner of the ship. We have to come to a point where we consider not these things. What? Because the promise is more important. And he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Sarah's womb. Now, he, he did not waver at the promise. He didn't waver at the promise. The promise has to become bigger to us than the storm. He did not waver at the promise. He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief. See, there comes a time when, yeah, when you first, God first tells you something, something first happens. Yeah, there's going to be a thing where I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about this. But that's when we have to get into the word and we have to renew our mind to the promise. Yes. Yes. This is what your word says. This is what, what you called me to do. This is the assignment on my life. And maybe, maybe you, you pump yourself up and then, but then all of a sudden, hey, storms come. You're like, I don't know if I can do it. You had to go back to and to a point where you get, just like Abraham was, did not waver. Because they did waver. We know they, wait, 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 they wavered. But we have to come to a point where we don't waver through unbelief. Now get this, and this is it. But was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Wow. Where did his strength come from? He was strengthened in faith. That boldness, The vision, the calling, the promise got bigger and bigger. How did it get bigger and bigger? By giving glory to God. By giving glory to God. He was strengthened in faith. I I don't know how this is going to happen, but Lord, I'm giving you glory. You are El Shaddai. Hallelujah. You told me to walk before you and be thou perfect. You're a covenant keeping God. Yet you told me to walk out, leave this land, leave my father's land and go to a land that I'll show you. You told me that, that you would told me that, hey, all this land that you would give me, you prospered me in gold and silver. You prospered me in all these things. You caused me to increase. You took me out and I saw the stars and I saw the sand and, and I do all, I saw all those different things and you planted a vision on the inside of me and you gave me this promise that I'm going to be the father of many nations. How did it get bigger on the inside of him? It was through leaning into him. It was through trusting in him. It was coming in and sitting down and remaining. It was pursuing him. It was lifting his hands. Say, God, I praise you that you're the one that, that, that made the stars. You're the one that multiplied. You're the one that created all things. You're the one that did all these things. Praise you, I praise you, I glorify you, I magnify you. 
How does the vision get bigger on the inside of you? It got stronger on the inside of him as he gave praise and glory to God. As he gave praise and glory to God. Praise and glory to God. In the middle of your storm, in the middle of your darkness, in the middle of what you're going through, is the time where you gotta lift your voice and praise him and glorify him because it's in that you're gonna get stronger on the inside. That vision is gonna get solidified on the inside of you. Hallelujah. I declare for you, you will not give up in the middle of your storm. You will not give up in the middle of your disappointment. But as you praise him and as you glorify him, your faith is gonna, gonna get, you're gonna have fresh wind of faith on the inside of you. but with strength and in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced, fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So what God had said, he was also able to perform. I think I said this a couple weeks ago, but I think someone else needs to hear it. And it's a testimony about my mom again because we have promise for our children and our children's children. And you heard me tell the story that, I, I think I told it, I, I know I told it years ago, I maybe, I, but anyway, I know I'm supposed to share this. Is my mom, the Lord finally told my mom, because she kept begging for my salvation, begging the Lord for, save Justin, minister Justin. <laughs> please save Justin, please. <laughs> And finally, the Lord said, stop begging me. Don't, don't beg me for his salvation. You have a covenant for his salvation. You have a promise for his salvation. And the Lord told my mom, don't pray for him another day. Mom, well, what do I do? He, she just said, just praise me. 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 Just praise me, just praise me, just praise me, just glorify me, just glorify me, just praise me, just glorify me. Every time that, every time you see him doing something, every time he smells like alcohol, every time he smells like, like he shouldn't smell, every time that, that, that you don't know where he is, you don't, he did, you don't know where he's sleeping, you don't know where he's at or who he's with, every time, and instead of worrying and, and begging my, for, see, he goes, just, just lift your hands and praise me and, and just thank you, just thank me, just thank me, thank, thank me, thank me, thank me, because it's already done, it's already finished, it's already done, it's already finished, it's already done, it's already finished. Hallelujah, it's already finished. So as she prays, it was like, she was like, okay, okay, okay. And six months later is when I had that encounter with God. And little by little, little by little, she, there was some different things happening. Things happening. I, I called my brother-in-law up one, one day and I was so drunk. I could, I, it was a Sunday afternoon and I called, I called, I called my brother-in-law and I said, Jay, I love you. Jay, I really love you. Thank you for being a good husband to my, to my sister. I love you. And Jay goes, um, you okay? Yeah, I'm, I just, I want to tell you, I love you. And you're like, what does that have to do with anything? It was a tender heart starting to happen on the inside of me. It was something changing. It was all of a sudden, you know, leaving the liquor store on a Saturday night and saying, maybe I'll drive to my sister's and go to church on Sunday. And then, then, then I would get drunk with her next door neighbor that, on Sunday night. So then it was like, I was going there to get drunk with, and, and with, with, with her neighbor. And next thing you know, it was like, here, I thought I was going there to party because it's a university town. And all of a sudden, little by little, little by little, it was like, Oh, maybe I'll go to church on Sunday. Maybe I'll go to church Sunday night. Maybe I'll play on the church softball team. Maybe I'll do that. And, and then my pastor, Jonathan Willie, is such a great man of God. He, he, he said this to me he, after I got born again and had that encounter. He, he goes, well, you hang around a slippery creek bank long enough, you're gonna fall in. <laughs> but there was something that happened in that process of time that God was working. But what was really happening was, was my mom was now in a place of faith and she was in a place of praise, in a place that she, her faith was strong and that what God you had said, you were also able to perform. I don't know how it's gonna work out. I don't know how, what's gonna change. I don't know what's gonna take place, but you said you do it and I know you're well able to do it. What you would promise, you're also able to form. You're able to do this. So we have to come to a place on, on how do we get strong faith in the middle of our storm? You praise, you praise, you praise. 
How, you praise. Hallelujah. And we'll pick this up next week because I only got like, I'm only like on part two of part seven. So we'll just see what happens next week. But you received this word this morning. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.